For this particular lecture session, I want to deal with the problem of evolution. People will tell you, you can't trust the Bible because it teaches creation, but we know now from science that man came about through the evolutionary process. Okay? Or they will tell you, if they're willing to assume that God started that process, they'll say the Bible teaches God created man in six days and that he was super you know, advising the whole process, and that man's not related to any animal origins, but rather God, as the Bible says, formed him out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. So that man is a special creation of God rather than, if you will, a natural consequence of an evolutionary process. Whichever approach they take. But another one is, well, the Bible teaches that man was created in six days, and we now know that it was billions and billions of years. And so, evolution proves to be, for many people, a stumbling block for Christian faith. And you know that this has been, from a cultural standpoint, uh, probably up to our generation, when moral issues have taken the forefront in this debate. The biggest cultural opposition to Christianity in the 20th century has come from the evolutionary debate. Everyone knows the famous Scopes trial and so forth and so on. So, it just makes sense that if I'm going to try to teach you apologetics and to illustrate a method of defending the faith, that I would take this biggest, most ballyhooed, entertaining uh, way of opposing Christianity. Now, the evolutionary debate hasn't simply been a matter of, uh, well, you Christians have what you believe, then here's our evidence against it, and everyone go out there and do the comparison and make up your own mind. Those who hold to an evolutionary view of man's origin have been very aggressive. They've been evangelistic in the first place, using the classroom as their, as their pulpit, and so forth. But they've also engaged in a great deal of, um, how can we put it? They are trying to control the educational process as well and make sure that they screen out arguments against their particular sacred cow. Now I bring that up, in a sense we're going to come back to it, but I bring that up at the beginning because you need to be suspicious of anybody who says, I don't want to hear the contrary evidence. And the irony is, I heard all through my educational career, I've read over and over again, I've heard the slurs, you see it on TV and so forth. Those who have faith are supposed to be acting that way. You know, it's us Christians who are supposed to be unwilling to hear the other side. Over and over again, people will say, the reason I don't want to send my child to a Christian high school or to a Christian college is that I want them to hear both sides of the issue. Yeah, right. Like they're going to hear the Christian side when they go to a secular school? Well, the fact of the matter is, and I've taught in Christian schools and in Christian high schools, and I've been an administrator of such programs, I'll tell you, heart and soul, we're the only ones in Orange County that told both sides. In fact, more than both. I taught a history of philosophy course to my high school seniors and so forth. I had them read what the other side had to say. Because, you see, the truth has nothing to fear from exposure. Granted, you may have some people out there that are real clever, sophistic debaters with false worldviews and so forth, and they may mislead people. But in the end, if you are patient, if you'll do the analysis and be critical in your thinking... The truth has nothing to fear from exposure to the other point of view. Why then is it that evolutionists today are acting like supposedly the fundamentalists did back in the days of the Scopes trial? you have any doubt that's true? I'll tell you. Well, I can tell you more than one story. I don't have that much time, but one that affects my own life. The state of Louisiana passed a law a number of years ago, in the mid-80s, if I have the, the dating right, they called for equal treatment of evolution and abrupt appearance views of man's origin or creationist views. Abrupt appearance meaning man is not, uh, did not come about through a process, a natural process, but just appeared. And it was called abrupt appearance in order to strip away any appearance of religious language and the connotations and the hanging on of religion. Now, I'm not too happy about that, mind you, but nevertheless, 
we have a law here that says the evidence for evolution must be balanced with the, ev with the evidence against and the other worldviews that compete with evolution. And of course, the ACLU, ever mindful of the rights and liberties of people, jumped in immediately and challenged that law so that it would not be implemented. And that went to the courts and then a long protracted process of taking depositions and preparing for a day in court um, transpired. And, and in that, I'm not even sure how it came about, but I got a call one day at school and someone said, uh, I need to know more about your, you know, your religious convictions and your uh, educational background because a number of people have said that you would be good for our expert witness in philosophy on this particular matter. And so um, I eventually agreed to do it. Now I want to tell you, my hesitation, my hesitation is that the, <clears throat> the defense in this trial, which amounts to the state of Louisiana actually, the defense wanted to take the approach that the teaching of non-evolutionary origins and the teaching of um, evolutionary origins is not religious. They wanted to say it's all just secular science, that's all there's to it. And I said, well that's not really true. The teaching of origins, in fact the teaching of anything foundational to man's reasoning and science is religious. And they said, yeah, but people won't understand that, they'll think that we're asking for religion in the classroom. And I said, you've got religion in the classroom, that's the point. Yes, but we can't use that language. So I ended up having, the reason why I agreed to do it is my point is evolution and creation science are on an equal footing in terms of their theoretical nature. If you don't want to use the language of religious, then I'll find other ways of putting it. But the, the point is evolution is not scientific and all the others are religious. Whatever you want to call the Christian view, the evolutionary view is that as well. Call it religious, call it a matter of fundamental conviction, uh, a matter of worldview on and on and on. So that's why I was willing to go into it, although I wasn't real happy with that particular strategy of calling it all secular. Nevertheless, we, we went into this. I had a long deposition I gave in downtown Los Angeles one day, about eight hours with the ACLU, a couple of lawyers, and they came in, boy, and their guns were loaded. About 10.30 in the morning, one of the lawyers asked for the court stenographer to stop, what he, what he meant is, I want to say something and have a discussion off the record, I and mean, you'll understand why he wanted it off the record in just a second. So she stopped and he turned to me and he said, I have to be real honest with you, Greg, I have never heard anything like this. He said, I have no idea what to say. <laughs> and essentially my argument was this, what sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. And I had just spent a little over two hours showing him that evolution is not a scientific theory. And that's what I want to tell you today as well. And after I give this lecture, I've, I've done this in places where people have heard it two or three times, and then finally, like after the third time, they go, now I've got it. So I, I'm hoping it won't take you that long to get it, but it is hard for this to sink in because it's part of the air we breathe culturally now. People think evolution is a matter of the facts of science disproving the truth of the Bible. And nothing could be further from the truth. Evolution is not even a scientific theory. Yes, I know it's taught in science classrooms. Yes, I know that it's pervasively labeled a scientific theory. And by the way, just so you don't be misled, I realize many pop publications on this will point out that evolution, you know, is not a fact, it's only a theory. That's not the point I'm making here. I'm saying that it is a theory, but it's not a scientific theory. It does not have scientific credentials. Evolution is a philosophy. And if you'd like to follow up on this, I just thought of this, I'm not a perpetual commercial, please don't take me this way. But if you get our catalog, you may want to get um, a photocopy of my article on worshiping, on worshiping the creature rather than the creator. It comes from the Journal of Christian Reconstruction from a number of years ago. And in the article, I basically just wanted to trace for people the ideological and cultural context of Charles Darwin's work, The Origin of Species. And I make the point there Darwin did not, I mean, if you know the history of philosophy, Darwin didn't give anything new to the world at all. 
he only put a scientific veneer on views that were being propagated long before Darwin. And we're going to talk about that veneer being very thin and, and inadequate, but nevertheless, evolution is not a scientific theory. Evolution is a philosophy. It is a worldview, actually. And so in the end, the way to refute evolution is to compare the two worldviews. And once we get to that point in this lecture, I hope you'll see how really easy it is. The biggest thing for a, an apologist, the biggest thing to get across, just like in my last lecture, the most important thing was to set it up right, you know, to close all the exits where people want to run out and to get rid of all the misconceptions so we can finally get down and narrow in on what the real issue is. And then, bing, 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 it's pretty easy. And the same way with evolution. The main thing you've got to get across to people is that evolution has no scientific credentials. It has no evidence, one, and two, it doesn't even have the traits of a scientific theory. That goes against everything they've heard. And so you may have to do this. You may have to shoot this bear over and over and over again with the same gun. You know what I mean by that? The temptation is for Christians when they have good arguments. Sometimes they see this bear running at them, and they have a gun that has good bullets in it, and they shoot it, and the bear is still standing. And so then they say, oh, I guess the gun wasn't good and the bullets weren't good. Got to go to something else. No, some bears take more than one bullet to put down. So shoot again and shoot again. <laughs> After you make this point, people will hear it, go in one ear, out the other, as we say, and they'll go right on talking like, well, we've got the facts of science and you've got this Sunday school faith commitment in God, the Creator. You say, no, that's not the nature of the debate here. You've got to make that point. And here's how I'm going to make that point. I'm going to begin by talking about some of the problems in the evolutionary theory. And I'll trust that you, some of you anyway, who are interested will read the more technical article on the cultural and philosophical or ideological background to the theory of evolution. But you can show people that they're really committed to something that has no scientific credentials. Just, you don't have to use these evidences, but bring up a few of the problems in the theory of evolution. I'm going to begin with this one. Back in 1967, a book was published entitled Mathematical Challenges to the Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of Evolution. Very technical book. It's not, you know, easy reading. Mathematical Challenges to the Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of Evolution. That was not published by a religious house. It was not written by Christians, much less evangelical Believers, it was not even written by people who are committed to creationism. It was written by people who were trying to be honest with their assumptions. The editors are Moorhead and Kaplan, and in the book, a particular author, Eden Murray, wrote an article entitled, Inadequacies of Neo-Darwinian Evolution as a Scientific Theory. Okay, so... Don't think it's some sectarian, prejudicial, biased, emotional Dr. Bonson who is saying these sorts of things. Here's this person who's not even a creationist, and I'm going to quote for you. Eden Murray says, It is our contention that if the word random is given a serious and crucial interpretation from a probabilistic point of view. Okay, that's the condition. If when you use the word random, you are interpreting that according to probability theory in a serious way, and I, 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 I wish I had five more hours with you so I could give you some background. This is really exciting. Probability theory attempts to give statistical and predictable um, meanings to words like random, chance, and so forth. And so this is the condition of this comment. Murray says, it's our contention if random is understood in a probabilistic point of view, the randomness postulate is highly implausible and that an adequate scientific theory of evolution must await the discovery and elucidation of new natural laws. Why is that? What's the mathematical problem, evolution? Well, if you believe that it happened randomly, then you've got to look at what are the probabilities of things coming together, you know, all this kind of uh, chance permutations, certain things end up being uh, amenable to the environment and surviving, and other things not, and so forth. It would take evolution to say that the world has been around 
of oh, between 15 and 25 billion years. How do you like that for a margin of error? 15 or 25 billion years. But the mathematical folks here did all of the probabilistic work and they said the problem is on the randomness postulate you would need hundreds more years than what any evolutionist tells you is credible for the for the age of this earth. And that's why, to put it tongue in cheek, you would need new natural laws to prove evolution. Mathematics, the theory of probability understood mathematically, has made it impossible to believe in the theory of evolution. Now that was in 1967. That was long before most of you graduated from high school or college. You tell me. Those of you who have gone to a secular school, everybody's willing to cry uncle now, right? Theory of evolution has just been slaughtered by the mathematicians. Now, you probably hadn't even heard that, had you? Michael Denton, in his book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, published in 1986, gives us some idea of part of the mathematical problem. He says, to get a cell by chance, according to the randomness postulate, would require at least 100 functional proteins to appear simultaneously in one place. 100 functional proteins to appear at the same time, at the same place. To get one cell by chance. And he says the probability for each could hardly be more than 10 to the minus 20th power. Class, who can remind us what 10 to the minus 20th is? What's another notation for it? 1 over what? 10. And then how many zeros am I going to add? You know, that's one whale of a big number. I want you to, you know, internalize this. Let me give some existential punch to this for you. When you go to Las Vegas and you're betting your hard-earned fortune, you go to the blackjack table and you hope that your probability is one in three. Doing pretty good if those are the probabilities that you're going to pull a winning hand. One in ten, if that's really what it came down to, only a fool would play blackjack. One in a hundred, by the way, we're only up to this zero right now, one in a hundred, it would be absolute suicide. You're not going to play blackjack if the chances of winning are one in a hundred. You don't put the money down on the table and say, okay, 99 times out of a hundred, you're going to take the money. I hope it comes up my time. One in a thousand, 10,000, on and on and on. Denton points out that for one cell, one cell, only one cell to appear, the probability could hardly be more than 10 to the minus 20th power for each of the 100 functional proteins. For each of them. That's the probability for one functional protein. But you need 100 functional proteins at least to have a cell that's alive. So that means I have to add another 10 times that. That is 10 to the minus 2,000th power. Anybody in Las Vegas going to gamble on that one? Now I hope you see what I'm getting at. Evolution requires you to believe that that happened. Fred Hoyle, in his book Evolution from Space, published in 1981, said that there are about 2,000 enzymes so that the chance of obtaining them all, obtaining all 2,000 enzymes in a random trial is only one part in 10 to the minus 40,000th power. And yet people believe in the theory of evolution. What do you think is fueling that belief? Is it because of the sterling scientific credentials? It's just so likely that that happened? That's what I meant when I said earlier 
I said in my debate with the atheist, the problem with atheism is it requires such a great faith. I just don't have that much faith to be an atheist. If you look at the fossil record, life appears in the fossil record abruptly, which is very distressing to the evolutionist. Not only does it appear abruptly, it appears in complex forms in the fossil record. And there are gaps, sadly, for evolutionary theory, systematic gaps between various living kinds in the fossil record. Now listen to me. We have hundreds of millions of fossils in the museums around the world. Hundreds of millions of fossils and not one of those fossil traces, not one of them provides an intermediary form or what was commonly called a missing link between these various living strata. Not one. In particular, there are no fossil traces of a transition from ape-like creature to man. In 1970, Lord Zuckerman admitted that in his book, Beyond the Ivory Tower. The Ivory Tower being those scientists who still believe in evolution. Paleontology is a great enemy of evolution. A great enemy. And so, it turns out, by the way, one of the men who was giving a deposition contrary to me in that ACLU situation in the Louisiana case was Stephen J. Gould, G-A-U-G-O-U-L-D. Gould is perhaps the most famous paleontologist in our country, maybe in the world today. He teaches at Harvard. Stephen J. Gould understands that the fossil record's an embarrassment to evolution, so he's come up with a new theory of evolution. You're going to love this. He calls it punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium. Here's the problem. The fossil record shows equilibrium, shows continuity. It does not suggest that what you have is um, the development of one simple form and then it gets more complex and more complex and more complex and evolves from one kind to another kind and then into a higher kind and so forth. And so Gould says, well, then I guess evolution must have taken place in short spurts rather than over the long haul. And if evolution took place in short spurts, if you'll grant me that hypothesis, then there would not be enough time to leave fossil remains during the evolutionary hot periods, and therefore the fossil record itself would be just what we find it to be, punctuated with these life forms. Yeah, some of you should be chuckling at that. And so, let me boil this down as a philosopher for you. Now, like Columbo, I just have one more question here. Dr. Gold, what you're telling me then is that the evidence for evolution is that there can't be any evidence for evolution? Is that right? That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying evolution must have taken place in such a way that it couldn't leave evidence in the fossil traces. There you have it. Does that look like a scientific approach or has somebody got his mind made up before he got to the fields where the fossils were found? Natural clocks show that there has not been enough time in Earth's history to accommodate any of the theories of evolution that are popular. I've already told you that evolutionists ask for 15 to 25 billion years for the life of the Earth. Now then, it takes about 1,000 years to produce an inch of topsoil by means of wind and rain, what we call erosion. Over a thousand years, erosion will produce one inch of topsoil. So the topsoil on the Earth's crust should be a very thick layer. Remember, we're supposed to have been here 15 to 25 billion years. You know what the average topsoil depth is around the Earth? Six to nine inches. There's not enough topsoil to account for Earth being here that long. So people say, oh, well, that's because it's been washing into the ocean. We would have that topsoil, but it washed into the ocean. Well, then we should be able to measure the sediment on the ocean floor, shouldn't we? In fact, the sediment on the ocean's floor should be miles deep if the earth is that old. 
the average depth of ocean sediment is 0.56 of a mile. Evolution is not believed by your professor or by your roommate or your next door neighbor because of its sterling scientific credentials. Evolution is a silly scientific theory. I know that sounds like I'm trying to be pugnacious or call names, but I mean that, believe me, I mean that in the philosophical sense. It's philosophical silliness to believe in evolution. And that's what I want to demonstrate to you. In terms of comparing worldviews, I want you to compare what makes sense out of the human eye. The evolutionary theory or the theory of special creation. Or what makes sense out of the fact that mammals have hearts and lungs and kidneys, by the way, that work together. And you're saying, if, if you don't know much about evolutionary theory, you may wonder why that's such an embarrassment to evolutionists. Evolutionists maintain that organisms develop gradually over time, okay? But we know from the functioning of the human body, not to mention cattle and all sorts of others, that it won't do any good for a human being to have a heart if the human being doesn't have lungs. And it won't do any good for the human being to have a heart if it doesn't have a kidney either, or kidneys. So you need heart, kidneys, and lungs all working in tandem, right? But the evolutionary theory says hearts must gradually develop, kidneys must gradually develop, lungs must gradually develop. And unless it's late in the afternoon and you're just getting tired, you should be sitting there saying, well, of course, it's a huge problem. How could you have hearts gradually develop if you don't already have lungs and kidneys waiting for them? But how could you have hearts and lungs wait, I mean, yeah, and kidneys waiting for them? They've got to be gradually developing too. And even if you believe they gradually develop together, which, by the way, is a silly picture. Imagine that, you know, these little, you know, proto-heart and hearts and proto-kidneys and proto-lungs. Well, we're going to grow up someday and work together. No, it doesn't work. The fact that they gradually develop, rather than appearing simultaneously in full mature form, makes it impossible for the organism to live any longer. <laughs> Evolution kills off all of its guinea pigs. The evolutionary theory simply cannot deal with that, cannot deal with the function of the human eye or its development. Because you see, every change in a living organism is preserved according to evolution because of its favorable interaction with the environment. That is, it provides some advantage for life. And so I'm going to ask you, if the human eye is to develop over a billion years, take the first step from the creature that had no eyes. The first step is not going to look much like an eye, but that first step is only going to be preserved if it is favorable to interaction with its environment. And so what is a proto-eye worth, do you think, to an organism? Well, I can tell you, it's worth exactly nothing. Not even a quasi-developed or halfway developed eye is beneficial to the organism. A fully functioning eye is real helpful. You can see, you know, the, the dinosaurs coming and run away and things like that. That's helpful, sure. But it's a real strange development, this, this eye. You know how the eye works? If you don't, that's another reason why Christians ought to study science. And it used to be a motivation for studying science, because you'll really glorify God. It's absolutely remarkable the way the eye works. But forgetting just the organism of the eye itself, the eye is wired, to use computer analogy, is wired to the back of the brain. You would not expect that on the evolutionary theory. It should be wired to the front of the brain. That would be the quickest and easiest way to do it. It's wired to the back, and it's backward wired. And as you know, the image that comes in is upside down, and the brain has to make it reversed. Now, what is it about all of that that was favorable to the organism? Again, the human eye is a great embarrassment. So is sex. Those of you who are alumni of uh, this institute know how I enjoy using that, because everybody wants to know about sex, right? So I'll ask you real quickly, because I know my time's running out. Where do babies come from? Don't tell me, we'll all be embarrassed, I know. You know that human babies come through what we call the process of copulation. 
You also know that we supposedly evolved out of a puddle of slime, to put it bluntly. And way back billions and billions of years ago, our grandparents were nothing but little amoebas. And the little amoebas didn't copulate. How do most organisms, short of sentient creatures, do carrots copulate? No. That surprised some of you? That worries me. <laughs> amoebas and other sorts of things multiply by cell division, don't they? Then when you finally get mobile and sentient creatures, um, then they learn about the birds and the bees from their parents and they make babies, right? Okay, that's real simple. You don't need a PhD to understand that. Evolution says we started out as non-copulating amoebas and we ended up, you know, with all this stuff that we do today to make babies. Okay, I want you to explain that to me. What is it that led to the changeover from cell division to copulation in the process of reproduction? And this is especially a juicy one. Explain to me how that happened gradually. <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to know what the value of a partially developed genital is. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at? I'm not really trying to be a comedian. This theory is silly. Anybody would think about it. If you didn't go into the classroom with this solemn presentation from a PhD, you'd look at this as like the child say, I don't think the king has any clothes on. You couldn't possibly believe that. But they do. They do. Compare the worldviews. Compare them. Tell me, oh, I erased it, so it's not there now. <laughs> Tell me if this sounds arbitrary to you. According to evolutionary theory, there was once nothing but disorder. And then the world as we know it, of course it was packed into an infinitesimal point. It became ordered and exploded. But the explosion created an ordered realm, if you will, that was inorganic. Okay, so we went from disorder to order. Now you have the right to ask everybody who studies philosophy, you get this is the one ticket, you get to say why. Could you explain that to me please? Why did disorder become order? We don't know, trust us on that one. Okay, so it's early in the morning you're saying, oh, okay, okay. But now this ordered inorganic world at some point began to live. Say so how? How did how did the non-living become living? This is contrary to every pattern of reasoning that you'll see in the scientific process and in logic, too. You can't get more in your product than what you had in the cause. And if there wasn't life to begin with, unless you think life is just a more complex form of non-life, by the way, there are real conceptual problems with that, life is just the complex version of non-life. It's like bricks don't live, but if you know if you put them together just right, then they'll look like they're living. Again, I'm giving you the, the comedian's version of it, but that is what the evolution is telling you. It was inorganic, and then one day it got so complex that it started living. Yeah, right. By the way, how did it get that complex? What caused it? Oh, well, we don't know. Well, that which was living, remember we just have soup right now, the little puddle of slime. It's living, but what's living is all identical in its life forms. The evolutionist says, now we must start getting diversity. And now the living identical soup becomes varied, unintelligent forms of life. Varied kinds of amoebas and other sorts of things. What caused the identical living soup to start diversifying into life forms? Well, we don't know. Well, those varied life forms were unintelligent and eventually, something developed that was intelligent and articulate. What caused all those various life forms to jump from non-intelligent to intelligent, from inarticulate to articulate? Well, we don't know. And then this language-using life form, which did not have any traces of morality previously, started having moral notions 
thinking in not terms of just what is the case, but what ought to be the case. Where did those moral notions come from? Well, we don't know. Evolutionists have tried in the past, always to their embarrassment, to explain the evolution of morality. It doesn't work. But usually, well, we just don't know. And so we're supposed to believe step by step by step by step that there were huge, unexplained, irrational changes that brought about the inorganic, then the organic, then the diversified, then the intelligent, then the moral forms of life that we now call man. I've sometimes said, you have to be careful with this remark that it not be taken in the wrong way, but I've sometimes said that the best refutation of the theory of evolution is just repeating it. If you really tell people, this is what the evolutionist is saying. Now, the reason I say that is because when people encounter the theory of evolution, it's always in little pieces, a little slice, allegedly, of evolution. And then evolutionists love to cheat on you. You have to be careful, not just here, but everywhere. Unbelievers will like to change the subject and then equivocate on the word. Evolutionists, when you ask them for evidence, will often give you evidence of change within a particular life form. You know, the famous moths that are light colored and then when soot is all over the trees because of the factories and so forth they're they're easier to find by their predators and so it turns out that they get darker wings so they can blend in with the trees I mean just about every book you read will give you that it has flaws in it too but nevertheless that is not the kind of evidence that's not the little slice that I'm talking about here because that's not even a slice relevant to the theory of macro evolution no one doubts that there are changes. I mean, just look, all of you are human beings, but look at all the different colored eyes, all the different colors of hair, height, weight, body build, that sort of thing. Yeah, there are changes within life forms. We want to know if there are changes between life forms. Evolutionists never give you that, but what they do give you is a little slice of something. And what I'm saying is, no, just tell the whole story for us, you know? You know, Daddy, tonight for bed, could you please read the whole book for us? And then you say, you expect me to believe this fairy tale? No rational person could believe this. And now we come to the startling conclusion. J. Tyndall, in 1874, wrote these words. The famous professor at Harvard trying to reconcile Christianity and evolution. And he said, the basis of the doctrine of evolution consists not in, before I read what it is, have I set it up? He's telling you the basis for the doctrine of evolution. Here's why you should believe in evolution. The basis of the doctrine of evolution consists not in an experimental demonstration, but in its general harmony with scientific thought. That was his way of saying what I began this lecture with. Evolution is not a scientific theory. It's that it harmonizes with the whole spirit of science. And of course here science is understood as a secular you know, procedure for interacting with and learning about the world. Or let's go to Stephen Jay Gould, our famous punctuated equilibria guy. In his article where he presented this theory, entitled Punctuated Equilibria, it appeared in Paleobiology in 1977, page 145. I am not making this up. The most famous paleontologist in this nation defending the theory of evolution says, and I quote, The general preference that so many of us hold for gradualism, that is to say evolutionary development of man, for gradualism, is a metaphysical stance. Metaphysics is a development, uh, is a division, pardon me, of philosophy that studies the nature of reality. So I'm just going to use the word philosophical when I reread this because I don't want to lose you. The general preference that so many of us hold for gradualism is a philosophical stance embedded in the history of Western cultures. It is not a high order empirical observation induced from the objective study of nature. The most famous defender of evolution in our country today says, we don't believe this because we've studied nature. This is a philosophical commitment on our part. 
Do you believe me now? No wonder it's not a scientific thing. Science would make this seem ridiculous. Tell the whole story, Daddy, and everybody goes, yeah, right. And so the answer is, well, we never, we never meant for evolution to be taken as an empirical theory. Evolution is a philosophical theory. Louis Benor in The Advocate, March 1984. Benor was the president of the Biological Society of Strasbourg, the director of the Strasbourg Zoological Museum, the director of research at the French Center of Scientific Research. And I quote, Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. This theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Well, but you know that it's useful, don't you? It's not useful for science, but it's very useful for religious purposes, for religious prejudices. Because as Darwin's bulldog once said, when we come up against Moses telling us we can go no further by order of the Creator, we need to break down the sign and proceed on. The value of the theory of evolution is that it enables us to dispute the biblical view of man's origins. And you know what? If you take away the first three chapters of the Bible, if you think about it, you've really taken everything away. And that has always been what gives evolution credibility. It is the first refuge of those who don't want to be stuck faced with what the Bible says. And so we've got to find another way to explain man's origins. Now time is very short. I'm going to say one more thing. Darwin held that the way in which evolution works, I told you this was a philosophy of life long before Darwin, he gave it scientific, a scientific veneer. What people didn't understand is how does evolution work? There were people who were committed to gradualism, but they said, scientifically, how does it work? And Darwin said, well, it's by uh, the survival of the fittest. Organisms change, and those which change and are the most fit for survival, then they survive, and they produce more changes and so forth. And the unfit ones drop off along the way. And that was supposed to be the mechanism, you see, that drives evolution forward. Survival of the fittest. And sadly, it wasn't Christians who pointed this out. It was analytical philosophers, people who are unbelievers and in some cases violently against Christianity who pointed out that the theory of evolution is not scientific at all because the survival of the fittest is not falsifiable. There's no way you could disprove the survival of the fittest. And the reason is there's no way to separately identify those organisms that are fit for survival and those organisms that actually survive. To test the theory, you'd have to say, okay, we know that these are the organisms that are the most fit, then we wait and see and say, oh, lo and behold, they're the ones that happen to survive. 